we're recording now. So let me just check and see if people are coming in because sometimes if there are a lot, it takes a moment to get everyone in, but we don't have any attendees, so you can go ahead. Okay, uh, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone, see instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, and I guess we do have a quorum of the Town Services and Outreach Committee present. Uh, and we have now are totally here. I see Shalini. Um, mm -hmm. I am calling the February 1st, 2022 meeting of the committee in, to order at 7.01. Okay. I will call upon each committee member, counselor by name. At that time, you should unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that they can hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Um, Shalini Balmilne. Present. Anna Devlin Gauthier. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Dorothy Pam, present. And Andy Steinberg. I didn't hear you, Andy. Uh, don't hear you. Present. Great, thank you. Uh, there is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let the chair or minute taker know. To make a comment or ask a question, please click the raise hand button. If te technical difficulties arise as a result of our utilizing remote participation, the chair will decide how to address the uh, situation. And discussion may be suspended while we address the technical issues. And the minutes will note if a discon disconnection occurred. We will be monitoring the counselors' connections, and if necessary, we will pause the meeting until they are reconnected. Um, I believe that I have sufficiently said the legal matter. Um, okay, so the meeting is called to order, and the first um, item is um, the proposed revisions for the parking permit system. Um, Oh, but Athena said, uh, actually, though, before we get into that, that we should um, address the um, meeting schedule, which I think we can do briefly, because we have to discuss the possible timing of a public hearing. So if that's okay with everybody, um, you did receive a copy of the dates uh, in the packet. Let me just see if I can find mine. Here it is. Okay. And this was built upon uh, a schedule that uh, Mandy Joe made in order to limit the number of evening devoted to town business, uh, we're gonna share Thursdays. And um, there are, it worked out very nicely. There are a couple of times I had to make a choice. And so there are a couple of choices that you have with this too. Um, and I think the first one that I see is September 15th or it could be the 15th or the 22nd, because sometimes town council meets two Mondays in a row, sometimes CRC seems to meet two times in a row. There's vagaries in the system, but she put her dates in and then I fitted ours in and that worked out quite well, I think. Um, I have no preference for September 15th or 22nd. If anyone has any comments, um, this is the time. Anika has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I thank you. I, I just have trouble seeing that. Um, Anika. Uh, if what you're asking is if we have an opinion between the 15th or yes. 22nd, right. uh, I would request the 15th. Okay. Uh, and Shalini, do you have oh. a thought? Yeah, I was going to say either is fine. And if there's a preference in the group for 15th, I'm okay with that. I was just going to say. 22nd only because of the minutes um, and we would get a break. If he did it on the 15th, that means we have to get the report of the TSO down for the 19th. 
and mm -hmm. if we had it on the 22nd we would get a week to turn that report around so that's the okay. only reason i would <clears throat> all right so that's that's of interest but um um anika if you have mm -hmm. a, a stronger reason let us know like you know so big I, do, things. I do have um another engagement i work engagement but i can either um I can figure, figure out a way if it needs to be, if it's best to be the 22nd, I can work around that and or if possible, attend virtually. Okay. All right. And uh, Andy, I see your hand up. Can't hear you. Can't hear you still. It's on mute. He's still muted. Oh, he's not able to unmute, I think. Yes, sometimes his computer has a problem with this. Yeah, oh, yeah. Got, there you are. Uh, so uh, I was trying to follow the uh, preferences of uh, the group. Um, I would prefer to do the 15th. Um, we uh, may be making a trip. Um, to Colorado to visit family and friends, and uh, it, it would be more likely to be in the 22nd that I'd be gone. But I could participate remotely from wherever I am. So, oh, I think that's a good reason, Andy. Um, you know, I think that you're particularly with your other committee finance, I think that's a good reason. So, um, I would say, can we have it keep choose the 15th and do we vote on this? Paul. Paul. Yes. Yeah. So can you look at the July, so it goes June 16th, July 30th, July 21. And I don't think July 30th is what you meant. It's June. It's June. Ah, oh, thank 30th. you. But I think June, June 30th. 30th is, I don't think that's, is that a? It is. It's it is June a Thursday? 30th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Actually, I had marked it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So it is. Yes, it is. It should be June thirtieth. Right. Okay. So that's why there's three meetings in June, and there's only one in July. But the June thirtieth is, you know, more or less in July, almost in July. Um, that was a that was a, an, an anomaly. You're right. Uh, but then I mis put the wrong month there. Uh -huh. Okay, so do we have to vote on the 15th or do we just- You can you can agree by consensus, but there are two hands up still. Okay, great. Andy. Oh, take it down. I'll take it down. Okay, and uh, Anna. Um, so this isn't about the September dates, although I would slightly lean towards the 15th, but that's possible. Um, the if there are dates that we know we will not be available do you want us to tell you right now or would you rather like what what process dorothy would you like for us obviously i mean i can tell you now i can email you athena what do you want us to do um if if it's not involved in a vote i would say email me great okay um so we have the big problem we have is in november um crc has taken all the spots the only other spot is Thanksgiving. And we're not <laughs> going to meet on Thanksgiving. I'm not even going to put that up to a vote. So, uh, Paul, can we get by? Because there are no other Thursdays. We could, we could make a Tuesday meeting or a Wednesday meeting in November, but there are no other Thursdays. CRC has them all. I, um, I would bet that you can get by. And if you need to schedule it, we can schedule it when we get closer when we look at our agenda. But actually, we can just, I mean, during the holidays, it's always hard to get extra night, nights in there. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm glad Paul caught the uh, typo on uh, June. Um, and if there's anything else, um, otherwise, it, Okay, there's a hand, Shalini. Yes. Yeah, and I think it's January 12th and January 26th. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, right. Maybe I was not looking in the right year. Okay. This is the 22, so that would be 23. Okay. You're right. Thank you. Great. 12th and 26. Yeah, I probably just looked up into the right 
22 instead of 23. Okay, so that's some really good catches. Um, so uh, we have chosen September 15th. We have corrected June 30th, keeping September 15th, uh, changing January 12 and January 26, leaving the November, second meeting in November blank, and we'll deal with it when we get there. Uh, Shalini, is that a new hand or old hand? Okay, so uh, shall we take a vote on uh, adopting this understanding that we can make changes if we need to? Do you have a set meeting time, Dorothy? It says 6.30 and 7. And right. Oh, thank you. That is the other question. Yes, this is, floor was wide open on this one. Um, I am more used to 6.30 meetings, um, but that's just habit. Um, so I have no particular preference. So those of you, uh, okay, I guess I'm gonna say Shalini, and uh, Anna um, and actually Anika, um, when if you're putting it a, a day of work in the daytime, does 6.30 or 7 make a difference? Anna. Sure, I mean, I'm, the earlier it is, the sharper I am. So I'm gonna go 6.30, but um, I, I will defer to other folks who have other responsibilities. Um, or things that might impact their schedules. I'm fine with seven, with seven but 6.30 would be my preference. Okay. Okay, Anika? Uh, I, I would vote for 6.30 as well. Okay. And Shalini, fine with you? Okay, good. Yes. That's excellent. All right, so we now have uh, a meeting time and we have clarified, uh, yeah, and, and Athena is fixing that up and okay, she's making the corrections on that, that's great. Okay, so um, does somebody want to make a motion to accept the uh, town services and outreach committee meeting schedule for January 22? To is this? Did I really make it to January 31st, 2023? Yes. No, I didn't. I didn't. I made it only through January 26. Okay. Well, I guess I guess you could say 31st since we're not meeting after the 26th. Okay, so we keep that true. Um, does anyone want to make that motion? Sure, I move we adopt the 2022 draft TSO meeting schedule as written by Chair Pam. And as amended by Athena, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and so I'll call the question and um, I'll just do it in the screen. Um, Can I ask for a second, please? Okay. Yes. Oh, thank okay. you. Was that Shalini seconding? Anika. Anika seconding, okay, great. Okay, so then I'll do a roll call and Anika. Yes. Yes. Uh, Dorothy will be yes. Uh, Andy. Yes. Okay, and Anna. Yes. And Shalini. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so it's approved on two one two two. Great. Okay, so now we've got that done. We'll go into our presentation. Um, and we have, um, I guess, looking at the way it was written, that Paul is part of one of the presenters with Jennifer LaFontaine. Um, Jennifer, LaFontaine or LaFontaine? What, how do you say it? Um, it's LaFountain. LaFountain. Yes. That's yes, going to be you. hard to remember. Okay. That's okay. Okay. And that's a La as in L-E, but it, I had it spelled L-A. Yep. Yep. Okay. LaFountain. Mm-hmm. I had relatives whose name were Beauchamp, who came here when the French Huguenots came here. The name became Bouchong, B-U-S-H-O-N-G. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and Sean Mangano, the finance director. So, uh, and Jennifer is the treasurer slash collector, and Sean is the finance director, and Paul is the town manager. So uh, we will look forward to your presentation. Thank you. And Sean's got a lunch, and Jen are going to lunch right into it. Okay, sorry about that. I have this thing where my headset and the Zoom mute sometimes work against each other, but all right, let's pull up the screen. Can everybody see that? Nodding heads, okay. So we wanted to quickly um, go over the existing permit system uh, real quick and then dive into uh, the changes we proposed and some of the, the rationale behind it. 
So this map is, is uh, too small for you to see, but what this is showing you is uh, three of the types of resident parking permits or town center parking permits that we have. Um, the shaded green bluish area, that's our resident only area one. So residents who live in the properties in that shaded area have access to that area one uh, resident permits. The orange area is resident only area two. So same thing, if you live in those areas, then you have access to those permits. And then the yellow area is everybody else. That's the larger um, town center um, permit for everybody else and for employees and employers who work in the downtown. The only uh, permit type that was not shown on that map are the reserved parking spots. So those are in the lower Boltwood garage. Um, you can also see the prices here. So $25 for the uh, resident permits and 35 if you have a second car, if you're um, an employee or employer. Um, a lot of people think that's per month, but that is the, that's been the annual fee. And the reserve spaces are $1,000. And there's actually, I just wanted to clarify, may have, we may have said this wrong at the council presentation. There's 28 of those, right, Jen? Um, reserve spaces in the garage. Um, I think the memo may have said 20. Yes, 28. So the next few slides just go a little bit into more detail on each of those permit types. Um, so the, the town center permit, it's September 1st through May 31st. Um, the qualifiers are you work or live in downtown in the downtown business district. You can see the proof, um, the requirements that we ask in terms of documentation to buy those permits. And there's a, a more detailed listing of the, the streets. So if you wanna look at a specific street, you can see it there. Same thing for resident only area one, but you can see the, it's a smaller, um, smaller group of streets and you have to live on one of those eligible streets to be, to qualify. And then resident only area two, they're even smaller. And then for the reserved permit um, for the lower Boltwood garage, one nuance that's a little different with that permit is it's a year round permit and it's from the date that you buy it. So if you bought it midway through the year, it would go 12 months to the next halfway point. Um, so that's a little bit different from the other permits. So all of these permit types, um, they, it, they don't generate a lot of revenue for the transportation fund currently, just so you have some context. Um, in normal years before the pandemic, they generate about 5% of the total revenues for the transportation fund or about $50,000 per year um, between the, the different resident permit types. The, I think the major objective was to encourage residents and employees to park in the periphery of the downtown area um, to keep the on-street parking and the public lots free so that patrons could, could use them and support downtown businesses. Um, so um, keep that in mind just when we talk about fee levels, that that is one of the objectives is to keep those um, these resident permits sort of um, attractive relative to the cost of feet in the meter or parking in a, in a public lot. And I saw a hand, I don't know if, before I go into the proposed changes, if there's any questions on the existing system, maybe we should stop and answer those now. Um, yes, I had a, a couple of, of quick questions. Um, when you, the permit type one and two, um, you say that on, I think it's district two is McClellan. Um, and yet I thought I heard her, uh, that I had a complaint from a person who lived on McClellan about the people who had permit parking. And I, uh, I, I guess I didn't think he was complaining about people who lived on his street. You're saying, I think he was saying that there were people who did not live on his street, but you're saying that on the, those McClellan spots are only for people who actually live in a house that is on McClellan. Is that correct? Jen, do you um, want to answer that one? Sure. So for the area two permit, it's from house number 50 and higher um, to the end where Lincoln Avenue is that qualifies for the area two parking. Um, the town center permit goes from one, one to 50 or 49 on okay. um, for McClellan. Okay, because there, there were some strong complaints about that. Um, and I was just wondering um, if those spots had to be for town center as opposed for residents. Um, 
then there's something else that we learned recently that there's a, a, something that's not quite as formal as this, but residents of North Prospect Street can get a guest pass that they pay for by the year so that they could have somebody park on the street. Is that still correct? We have one day visitor passes. Yeah. Um, any, any permit holder is eligible um, to, they're eligible to receive up to 30 at no charge. And then the second 30 would be a dollar a piece. Um, we try to limit that and give them out five at a time just to keep the parking down a little bit. All right, so, so a person has to have a paid parking permit in order to get this visitor pass. Yes. Okay. And I think we were trying to figure out why on North Prospect, and is it that some of the streets don't have driveways? Some of the, the people, some of the houses don't have a place for the car to park for the people who live there? Or? It, it could be. Um, it, it could be that maybe they are only a lot for two parking spaces for an apartment that houses four people. Mm -hmm. it, it could be something like that also. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Can I ask my question? Is that oh, yes, please. Anna, All right. Um, Sean, do you have a or or Jennifer, do you have a count on the population change of those streets in the past few years? So I'm, I was I'm looking at the chart of permits, um, residential, non-amorous registration, employee permits, reserve spots. Um, so kind of a two-parter here is. Are we seeing, this seems proportionate to population living downtown, right? And so I'm curious if there's kind of, if you've got an idea of, of um, which areas you're anticipating a rise in need, if that makes sense. Second part of that question is, does that matter? Because um, it might not matter and that would make that null. Um, and then the other question is, and I apologize if this is in there, um, percentage, how, are we close to capacity on, on the permits that we sell or no? Like, are we, yeah, are we anywhere close to how many we could sell? So, and that's math I could have done and I apologize for not doing it. No, no, those are, those are great questions. And that's some of the, what we're, um, I don't know if we're gonna have satisfying answers today, but I think our goal is to be able to provide um, good data, data on this in the future. So Jen, our, our current, up until this point, until we switch to open gov, um, Munis was not able to capture this type of information in a, in a user-friendly way, correct? Correct. We just um, kept paper copies of the eligibility and then shredded it at the end of the permit season. Right. So, so, we never kept yeah. it. so with OpenGov, which is what we're, um, have we are, we're, we're moving to, which allows us to create fields um, and track it over time and, and be able to pull data, um, we'll be able to track things like registration status, um, we can put in information about location of uh, the residents um, to be able to determine like if there's a, a greater need in one area, things like that. So we will be able to track that data better in the future. I think it is something we would wanna, um, would help us make more informed decisions about if we ever look to expand the resident parking areas in the future. If there's a, a buildup in one area of town, it, it might make sense to look in that area to, to expand the resident parking. Um, and we do, look at the overall number as well to get a sense of, you know, are we overselling the permits? I don't think we've heard many complaints from resident, um, from permit holders that they were unable to find spots, but Jen, maybe you can speak to if you've, if you've heard of any of that over the, over the years. Um, the only complaint that I, that we would hear on a semi-common basis would be um, people not being able to necessarily find a parking spot that's most convenient for them. A lot of people like to park as close to where they live as they can, and that's not always an option with the permit. Right. Thank you. Jenna, do you have the, the number for the number of uh, resident permits issued this year? I have, um, as of right now, I can tell you that we have somewhere around 548 permits sold overall. I didn't actually break that out to um, to what was town center and what was residential. But I think when we did our sample, it was somewhere around 15 or 20% residential. 
did we yeah or and, we that, and that includes no so um so that number includes employee permits as right. well correct um right. yes but no but when we what we did is we did a sample of 20 permits and we looked at how many of those were registered in amherst and how many were not registered in amherst to get us a sense of um the the thing we'll talk about coming up with the proposed changes about whether people are paying excise tax that are using the the permit system um and of that sample 75 percent of them were not registered in amherst their vehicle and 25 percent were so thank you uh, yeah um, yeah. Oh, Shalini. Just a quick follow up. Um, the 548 number, is that very different from what it used to be before COVID or were the numbers similar back then? It is. Um, in FY19, we had just shy of a thousand permits sold overall. And FY20, um, before the pandemic really came into effect, we had just over 800. So it has decreased a little bit. Yeah, the transportation fund is definitely um, one of, if not the most impacted sort of areas of our financial world um, from the pandemic because of the um, depopulation at times, but also the, the decline in some activity downtown. Um, okay, I'm call I raised my hand, so I'm calling upon myself. Um, I can continue to get confused with the word resident because here you mean resident of the block but everywhere else it just means lives or works in the town of Amherst um, and um, I think we have to be make sure that the people who, who live on a street are able to park their cars um, and um, I understand that the you're not right now you can tell who's a who because of basically where the car is registered. But once you get your new system in, and if people in fact comply, then you're not gonna be able to tell that just by whether the car is registered in Amherst or not. So yeah, yeah. details. I think one thing just to, um, to clarify, so they're all residents, um, whether they're renters or they, or they own a home in the area, um, they're still all, re they're all residents. Many of them are counted in the census. Um, and so they're all, they are all residents of Amherst. Um, so again, I, I think this talks, when we talk about resident only areas uh, permits, you know, it's talking about a specific area of residents in a specific area, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think there's a, a different meaning of the word resident, um, but I just want to clarify that they are residents of the town. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, Anika. So uh, I have a question. To be clear, how many uh, guest permits or guest passes rather did you say that each permit came with? And is that number for every uh, any permit whatsoever or by tier? It, it really goes, um, you qualify by having the permit to be eligible, but it goes by household, household or business. So um, if you have four people renting an apartment downtown, they're eligible for up to the 30 free and then they can buy the second 30 at a dollar a piece. So it wouldn't be $60, 60 permits for each of the four. Oh, wow. Okay. It, it wouldn't be, Jen, is that what you said? It, it, right. It would not oh. be. It would only okay. be 60 for the, for the total unit, not for the total for each person in okay. that unit. Mm -hmm. By the unit, right. Okay. All right. All right. Um, Do you want me to keep going? I think so. Yes. Okay. All right. So the changes. Uh, so we proposed increasing the uh, all of the fees over three years. Um, the resident permits we proposed increasing from twenty five dollars. Um, we proposed breaking into two sort of pathways. So if your vehicle is registered in Amherst and if your vehicle is not registered in Amherst. So if it is registered in Amherst, we propose increasing it to 50, then 100, and then 150 um, by FY25. If it is not registered in Amherst, um, which again, based on our sample was about 75% of the permits, um, we propose increasing it to 150, then to 300, and then 400. 
employee permits, we wanted to keep low, um, recognizing that um, you know there's all different levels of wage earners that work downtown, and we didn't want employment, you know, parking as it relates to employment to be a major cost. Um, so we did increase it because it hasn't been touched in um, 20 years, but we tried to keep that low relative to the other fees. And then reserve spot permits, we increased from 1,000 up to 1,100, and then 1,200 and then 1,250. Uh, some of the rationale that went into this was we, um, the number one thing was we wanted to generate funds for capital improvements. Um, these fee levels we played around with to figure out how we could get to being able to dedicate somewhere between 10 and 15% of our revenues once we get to more of a normal activity level downtown, um, be able to dedicate to capital improvements like lighting, signage, um, the garage has a number of, of capital needs that um, long-term that we would wanna make. Um, so that was sort of the overarching goal of how do we generate some funds that we could dedicate. And that relates to the, the recommendations from the downtown parking working group and, and the NIGARD report. Uh, we wanted to do the transition over three years because we know, um, I, you know, what we heard from the council is maybe these fees aren't increasing fast enough or high enough. Um, but again, like with all fees, we didn't necessarily want to go from zero, nothing changing for 20 years, and then try to make up all of that in one year. Um, we wanted to reflect that these are residents, that we wanted to give them time to adjust to the higher fees. And so that's why we had this transition plan over three years. Uh, the separation of where the vehicle is registered, again, that's about, uh, about where the motor vehicle excise tax goes. Hopefully you had a chance to look at that chart in the memo um, that compared Amherst to some of the other towns and, and you can see what, what an impact that makes. Um, I talked about the employee permits. And then the other thing is, uh, so this is a plan to get us to FY25. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't continue to review and modify after that point. It doesn't, it doesn't mean we have to stay there for the next 20 years. Um, most of our fees, and then this will be included, we review on an annual basis to make sure they're appropriate um, and we make, can make more regular adjustments so that the increases aren't as large, um, but they're more regular and reflect the needs of the, of the capital system. Here are uh, some comparables, just so you have a sense of what those fee levels, uh, these aren't like exact comparables, so just keep that in mind that these are a little bit different. Um, but the Northampton has a couple long-term lots or a few long-term lots near Main Street. Those are about $540 per year. Uh, UMass has parking lots that range from 279 if you're a student up to 628 if you're a staff member. Um, and the staff member, it ranges based on your salary or how much you earn from UMass. So there's a lot of uh, levels to what you might pay uh, for those UMass lots. Uh, the garage ranges from 967 if you're a student to 1,515 if you're a staff member. And then we reached out to One East Pleasant, which is one of the newer developments downtown, and they have about 35 spots. And what they reported to me was that uh, it's about $3,000 per year if you're in one of their covered spots and $1,800 per year if you're in an uncovered spot. Um, so that tells me there is a demand for you know, for down, that's quite a bit. Um, and they said they were, you know, looking to increase fees in the future, which again tells me that there's demand um, for that. So keep that in mind for the next slide. Hold, hold one second. We've yep. got, Anna has her hand up. Sure. Sorry, Sean, I'm trying to do math again. So yeah, uh, the, can you go back up one more? Yeah. All right. So looking at this, correct me if I'm wrong here, the employee parking is doubling. The residential mm -hmm. with their car registered in Amherst is going six times higher. Mm -hmm. The outside uh, vehicle registered outside of Amherst, that's 16 times higher. The The reserve spot permit is like 1.14. Is that right? Percent times higher? Yeah, it's going up like 25%. Why not jump that up? So that one... Because um, that feels just... relatively low. Yeah. Compared, so that, yeah. So that one, we used to have a wait list for Jen, maybe you can talk to the wait list for that right now. Um, it's waned a little bit in recent years. So that is one we could look at increasing more. Um, I think again, there, there are some capital improvement needs related to the garage that we would want to, that we've heard reports from, um, from the bid and others that there are things we might want to do to improve that space, but um, we could look to increase that one more, um, especially given the, the 
costs for one East Pleasant Street, for example, and what those are going for. But Jen, do you want sure, to talk about yeah. the, the, the wait list? Um, so currently we do not have a wait list. Um, in years past, we had a very long wait list. Um, people have the uh, people that are space holders now have the option to renew at the end of the year. So I don't know if that's discouraging as far as um, the space is not turning over frequently. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily pushing for that right now. I'm just trying to understand why that one didn't jump nearly as much percentage wise as the other right. ones. And the, Thank you. and the one thing I didn't put on the comparable um, page, but the garage in Northampton, that's what I want. Um, the garage in Northampton. So if you're a leaseholder, I believe it's $90 per month. And that comes out to about $1,100 <laughs> per year. Um, so that was one area where we were not as far out of whack um, yep. with, with another garage. But you're right, that is, um, it's sort of supply and demand. There's, there's very limited spots there. So <clears throat> look to that. Thank you. Uh, I think Anika has her hand up. Okay, Anika, I call here. I had a question about uh, one, the garage and lot at uh, One East Pleasant. Mm -hmm. Do you know what percent of those spots are utilized by residents of, or should I say that are not residents of One East Pleasant Street? Um, I don't. I, I, when I asked them, I was sort of under the impression that those, it was only for residents of, um, of One East Pleasant Street, but I don't know that for sure. Okay. Um, but you. we we could reach out. They you know they got back to me actually very quickly um, from when I called. So, Sean, did you say eighteen spaces? Um, uh, so one East Pleasant Street. They said they I think they had thirty four spots. Thirty four. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that and that's a mix of covered and uncovered. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, we'll go. So there were a couple other changes. Um, one of them relates to the reserve parking as, as Anna brought up. Um, the first one is more just around simplicity. Uh, right now the permit system is, is it nine months or 10 months, Jen? It's nine months. Nine, nine months. months. So, so one thing we thought um, we've heard from some people is you know maybe making it 12 months or there's some rationale to not having it cover the summer so that anybody can park in those spots if they want. Um, but then again, it just makes it a little confusing when they run from September to May. So. So one thing to consider is it's not a huge thing for us, but potentially making them a year round permit, um, the residential permits a year round permit as opposed to nine months. The second one, so before we, earlier in the summer when we were working on this, we did a walk around with the parking enforcement officer and um, just visited all the spots to get a sense of what were their capital needs and, and just talk about what they've observed. And there's a number of spots that have historically been a little underutilized in town. Um, that are public lots right now, you'd, you'd pay at the kiosk or a meter. And so those might be good opportunities for us to expand reserve parking and creating dedicated spaces that we could um, get a you know, dedicated revenue, a thousand or whatever the fee ends up being for those spots. Um, and those locations are Prey Street and Whalen Lot and Olympia Drive. And so Prey Street, that one we might want to monitor before we consider adding any reserve spots there because of Kendrick Playground is now there. Um, and we might wanna see what that does to the demand uh, at Prey Street parking lot. Um, but before that, previously it was not heavily utilized. The Ann Whalen lot, which quite frankly, I had no idea existed until he walked me back there. I don't know if you all know, already know about that lot, but behind Ann Whalen against the fence, there's I don't know, 10 or 15 spots um, that are technically public um, town parking. Anybody could park there. Um, again, not heavily utilized. There's a charging station back there, but not heavily utilized. And that's sort of you know, close to the center of downtown where it might be um, a good location for a reserve spot. And then Olympia Drive, um, I believe it's metered, Jen, is that correct currently? So Olympia Drive has some metered spots. It's close to a UMass parking lot and you, um, and you saw some of the rates for what UMass charges for their parking lot. Um, it's not heavily utilized metered parking. And so that also might be a good location if, we, if our reserve spots were a little bit less expensive than UMass's um, to convert some of those to reserve parking as well. I'm going to call upon myself. Um, I would recommend that no new permit spots be added until after your new signage mm -hmm. campaign is done. Sure. Because, because of this recent conversation, 
I discovered, I clearly, I've lived here 11 years. I did not know many of the places where there were parking lots. I did not know the ones behind um, the toy box. I just had never seen it before. Um, and for example, Kendrick Park uh, uh, patrons, they need to know, hey, there's a parking place. So after you get your signs up and people have a chance to get used to saying, oh, hey, let's use that spot. Um, then I think you could see if some place right. doesn't get used. But right now, some things aren't used because people haven't connected them in their mind, I think. Right. No, that's a good point. Okay. So that, um, just quick wrap up. Um, so again, the goal of, of most of these changes are to build a, a self-sustaining system where we can make some of these capital improvements that we've talked about. Um, Jen has a lot of experience in this and, and she wanted me to emphasize that simplicity is key, um, both in administering the program and for residents to understand the program, um, that whatever changes we do make, making sure they're really easy to communicate and understand. Um, that if, if we do make any changes um, and we wanted them to be in effect for July 1st, we have to order permits ahead of time. So just keep in mind that there's a little bit of a lead time um, from whenever any changes are approved to, to when they would um, go into effect. And then uh, just to reiterate that we do review the parking permit system annually. Jen looks at it every year. We communicate the information out. Um, and I think this is an area because it hasn't been touched maybe in um, you know, quite some time that we would look to make more regular updates going forward um, and not let it sit quite as long. And questions? Dorothea, you're muted, but I'm, I'm you're, right. Okay. I've recognized you. Yes. I was like, I think I can read your lips. Um, so <laughs> I, um, uh, this came up earlier, Sean, about how we're collecting data of like usage data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I know this is the beginning of, I believe this is the beginning of a, a continued conversation and a, or a longer, this is a big deal. Um, but I'm curious your, if you have an answer now, fine, or this is something I'd love to see kind of continually worked in is what data will you be collecting? Um, what data do you need, right? So, and how do you plan on using it? As you said, you review this annually. Um, and so what's going to be helpful and how are you going to get it? That's my question. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, there are, I think there's a few things we can note now, but some of it will we'll probably uncover as we build out um, the forms and what we're asking for. Um, as I said, the registration status, I think is something we collect now. It's just not in a format that we can easily review it and see how things change over time. Um, areas or, or locations where maybe there are um, growing increases for parking permits especially as new developments go in town um, and seeing how that impacts the numbers. Um, and then one of the other things that we're gonna be looking at is just over, um, it's not necessarily on the parking permit system itself, but um, downtown parking in general, where we look at utilization reports and Jen has done a really great job at pulling the, the data that she has from the different sources that we have to be able to look at demand for lots, um, peak times and things of that nature. Um, and that comes into play because right now we have a lot of aging meters on the on the streets mm -hmm. um, and we can't get good data from those meters they're just they're coin operated older older meters that are becoming harder and harder to replace and so one question that will be coming up is what do we do with those meters and i think from a data perspective we're sort of interested in getting either smart meters or converting to kiosks um, for those locations where we can better track demand um, and if we had all of our parking spots, meet, you know, our public lots and our metered spots um, all on the same system, we could have really mm -hmm. robust uniform reports on, on demand for parking and peak hours and things of that nature. Um, Jen and I actually met with a, a representative earlier, was it earlier this week or late last week um, from our kiosks, our parking kiosk system, where if we were, if we had our whole system on the kiosk system, um, and you know, they would be able to do things like heat maps and be able to tell people if they, if they wanted to use their phone, they could look at a heat map and, set, and see where um, parking was most likely to be available based on the activity in, at that time, because um, it's all broken out by zones. So there's a lot of stuff, there's a lot of cool activities and, and new um, strategies we could use to communicate parking information better to residents um, if we make some of these capital improvements. And so that ties back to the data um, that again, we wanna be able to just track utilization um, and be able to report on that better. 
Okay, Anna, are, is that hand still up or a new question? It's a new question, so Andy can go and then I'll go okay, after. Fine. Andy, your turn. You're muted, Andy. For this purpose. You're unmuted now. Okay. I think now I'm okay for a moment. Yeah. Um, Good. Uh, it's just follow up on the quest the last question that you answered. You, know, you were talking in terms of the kiosk holders and how does the information gathering from Parkmobile fit in with the information gathering from the uh, kiosks. Yeah, so that that also creates a struggle. So um, our our kiosk provider is different than our app provider. Um, and so if you, you know, to get the best system where we can provide the, the, uh, the best information to the public, we would need to move towards a uniform system where the kiosks and the app were all by the same provider um, so that all that data could be pulled and looked at simultaneously. Um, and so Park Mobile does have a solution and that was part of what we were looking at uh, this week just to get a sense of what it looks like. Um, and some, they have implemented it in some larger cities. Uh, Park Mobile is popular around here and there's a lot of communities use Park Mobile around here. So if you, I think Northampton has it. So, you know, if you have the app for Amherst then you also have it for Northampton. And so there's some convenience that way. Um, so there's always trade-offs with these things. It's never easy where you can just, um, you know, one solution fixes everything. So if we were to switch payment apps, you know, it would be more convenient for Amherst, but it might be less convenient if you're somebody who travels to towns around here. Um, so you're right, Andy, that does, that's a major consideration is that app and it does create a barrier to us um, providing the best information to the public. And I think UMass is also in Park Mobile. Yeah, they are. Oh, great. Okay, uh, Anna. All right, so we've got, six ev stations now five of them are downtown is that still correct sounds right stephanie Chicola it sounds would right, right? The, would know, of, she would know the most but as um. of 21 roughly <laughs> we'll go with roughly unless something magical has happened um so as we think about you know we we know or hope that more, more folks will be moving towards electric vehicles are there sufficient ev charge i know this is like this is adjacent right um and maybe this is a question of when we start having more money in the transportation fund, we can do things like this. Um, but I'm curious about the possibility of making sure that we have EV charging stations where these permit park it, per, par, permit parking places woof, exist. Um, and I know, you know, I know that they're in the garage, the Boltwood garage. I know Prey Street has one. I think that's it for the areas that you, I know one's behind town hall. Yeah, Paul, help, you wanna jump in here? So there are two. There are two. Uh, two spots outside of Johnny's. Um, yeah. There's there's two at the Ann Whalen lot. There's there's some at Prey Street. There's two behind Town Hall. Um, and then you know we can as we get funding to install these things are very expensive. As we get yeah. funding, we 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 can we have a sort of a you know Stephanie's working on a grid to sort of lay out where the next ones go. Yeah. There's one at so the I, middle school as well. Yeah, that's yeah. the one that's like not downtown. So yeah. so I, my question, Sean, though, is like as we're considering these these permit plans, are we ensuring that folks who are getting these permits are also able to charge their cars if they need to or things like that? Like, is that grid that Stephanie is creating or hopefully will create eventually, is that going to be overlaid to make sure that we're not disadvantaging folks who are who are driving EVs? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't have a great answer, but I do think um, Stephanie has been focusing a lot on the EV sort of roadmap and where they are. Um, we did apply for a, a grant uh, recently for a fast charging station. That's sort of like the one thing we don't have a have is like one of those super fast charging stations. Um, and I see Paul jump in and probably provide more information. The one one other thing we are looking at is um, there's a lot of federal funding coming out soon for this type of thing. And so we wanna make sure that we're in a good position and have done some of the legwork um, so that when that federal funding does come out, that we're in a good position to apply for those funds um, and potentially get some of that grant funding to expand charging stations. If I can weigh in here, Dorothy. Yes. So, um, so the EV stations won't be in permitted areas because we want turnover. We, those, it's important for that not someone just to park there and be there 24 seven. So we want them to be there for the time it takes to charge and then to move on to someplace else. Thank yeah. you. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 
and people do pay. So if you do charge your vehicle, you also have to pay for the, the spot mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. I, ha I have a question. Um, I thought I heard at some one of these meetings at, at some point that the uh, kiosks were not so convenient for old people and people who are disabled, uh, I guess because they have to walk to them or something. Um, have you any um, feedback on that or heard any of that? Or is that really, because I understand that uh, one system where everything matches is really important. I just want yeah, to no, I think that we have, I think there is some general feedback about just being careful around technology and, and you implementing new technologies without consideration of the people that are using the technology and, and making sure it's um, easy to use and explained and understandable. So I think that's always something um, that we look at. Um, and again, like anything else, there's trade-offs, um, you know, so the way they do kiosks, it's usually one kiosk for every 10 parking spots, roughly. Um, so if you can imagine downtown, what that might look like. Um, the nice thing of it is it, it would take out all those intrusions into the sidewalk where the meters are. You get rid of those meters every, you know, every eight feet or so, um, and it would clean up the sidewalks in a lot mm -hmm. of ways too. Um, but it is a consideration that we have to have is making sure that um, everyone can use them and they're explained and, and they're, um, their support there if it's needed. Okay. All right. Do we have any other um, questions or comments on this report? Um, Can you make your hand? Yes. I had a question. Uh, what is the cost of a fast charging EV station? We can get that information to you because I, I don't have the estimate off the top of my head, but we do have a somewhat recent one. Um, because we applied for this grant. So I, we can, I can send that out unless Anna maybe has that information, but um, I don't know if she's raising her hand because she has the answer, but, um, but we can send that out because we do have a, a pretty recent estimate. Thanks. There's just some, just in addition to that, there's some things like, so whenever we put these charging stations in, the, the part just to remember is that we have to be able to get electricity to it. Um, and that's, you know, that's sort of like the bane of Guilford Mooring's existence is, is making sure that these um, charging stations, that there's access, the electricity can get to it. Um, uh, in a way that doesn't create a whole bunch of additional costs. Okay, Anna, or are you okay, saying it's, it's uh, so? Um, when you, you're talking about the kiosks, and I just I'm trying to keep everything in nice little boxes in my head. So when you talk about the kiosks, that is not relating to these permits, correct? Because these permits are done correct. through Open Gov. They get a little sticker, they pop it in their car. That's that. The kiosks are really for hourly parking. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. And Shalini. Sorry about that. Um, okay, just making sure that there'll be signage for the EV charging stations, just as we're thinking of parking signage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think um, there, I think there's signage now, but um, but one of the things again we're looking at is once the wayfinding system goes up, we're going to mm -hmm. sort of assess what are the areas that maybe additional signage is needed to highlight something, um, whether it be the entrance to a parking lot, if the EV mm -hmm. part, um, charging isn't really clear, things like that. And can I also um, bring back a question that actually Anika had? Oh, Paul, did you want to respond to this first? Yeah, so most of the EV stations um, <clears throat> go, you know, it, it's a company uh, and we use ChargePoint. It goes mm -hmm. on their system. So when you are searching for an EV charging station, it's yes. you, when you have a car, it usually says where they are, it knows where they are. It's not like you're driving around looking necessarily, you usually know exactly where you're going and you, you plan your trip accordingly. Got you. My next car will be just announcing. Um, can I also just say that actually this was a, a question that Anika had raised in the council meeting when you all made the presentation. I just want to make sure that we have it on record here too about um, any hardship provisions for permits. Yeah, so there currently isn't. Um, I think, you know, something we could certainly give thought to, it would be difficult, um, maybe not difficult, but it, we'd, we'd have to take give a lot of thought to it because of mm. um, the student population that might be renting these, using these permits. Um, they may not have income themselves. So it's just, you know, thinking about how the permit actually ties to mm -hmm. income and, and overall ability to pay is, that might be a little more complicated with parking permits. Can I add to that for a second? Yes. Dorothy. So um, 
I think if, if we're if we're thinking along the same lines, we're thinking about restaurant workers downtown who are the lowest mm -hmm. paid employees. A lot of times, the restaurants themselves will buy parking permits for them, and then they'll distribute it to their employees. It's it's twenty five dollars. So like Johnny's, uh, I'm not sure if they do this or not, but Jen would know. Like maybe Johnny's buys five or something to give to employee. I'm not sure exactly. Mm. Don't they do that, or they pay? Or I think Matt's barbershop might do that. Oh, definitely, some of the downtown businesses do that they have one person that will log in and apply for all the permits and then they bring a check over for the total for us yes okay um i wanted to add something that i learned today that um umass has a there's a carpool um reduced parking permit thing i don't know the details on it but that uh, tracy zaffian says that she has used that um so that is something that would be because I know some people are concerned about students and can they afford the, the uh, uh, parking lots there. Um, but going back to a previous point, once you get your unified system in and you, you will then people will be able to get a phone app for whatever your system is and you'll be able to, to say Amherst parking places and they'll list the lots or maybe show you a map or you can say charging stations and they'll list them. I'm, I have not used one of these things, but uh, tell me what a driver who comes into Amherst, doesn't know Amherst, what he could find out about parking if, his, if he has the app that will go to our new system. Um, so again, this is separate from the residential permit system, but this, again, this is just for downtown parking, metered public parking. If we had everything on a kiosk and the app, if all those were consistent with the same vendor, um, they could see sort of a map of downtown with the different zones and what what he showed us or um, and, and other other vendors have this too so it wouldn't have to be with this vendor but um sort of a color heat map of those different zones based on where the busiest uh, the most activity is so um you know main street lot might be red at certain times of the day where it's really busy and the prey street lot might show up as green as being underutilized um so what he explained to us is it's you know it's about 90 percent accurate it's not going to get you you know to a specific spot um you know things could change in the meantime but it'll tell you um, based on experience and the activity where you're most likely to find a parking spot um because all the utilization you know they have algorithms that can look at how many spots are in that zone how many people have paid for parking at that time period and have a pretty good sense of whether there should be spots available at that location. And, and one thing that people have asked in terms of permits, um, people keep discovering and then they forget it, that a place that has a sign saying there's a permit, that, that, that the general public can park there on evenings and weekends. Right. And this is something the general public keeps forgetting and then rediscovering. Would the app be able to tell you that? Um, so I think those spots are general, I mean, there's generally, at least when I've come into town, there's spots available. Um, I don't think you would need the app necessarily for that. Um, mm -hmm. again, we don't have the, those aren't part of the, the kiosk area currently. So they wouldn't be attached to a zone. So I don't think the app would tell you that mm -hmm. those, um, not unless we somehow had some sort of, um, GPS that brought those spots in. Because that's a great source of parking that people aren't using that would be certainly useful for our entertainment spots, our weekend activities, if people knew that. I mean, it's like, you know it in one part of your brain, but you don't remember it yeah. in the other part of your brain. And, and we can send, um, we can push out information more regularly. Um, we mm -hmm. talked about just communication efforts in general. We can send out those communications um, to, you know, especially if, you know, before the fair comes or um, mm -hmm. before other large events come to remind people that those spots are available um, and you know, let them know where they are. Okay, so do we have any other questions that we have for our uh, panelists or for Paul? Um, okay, um, I see that we have two people in the uh, attendees. Um, do we have any desire, anyone gonna raise their hand for public comment um, with questions? I'm giving them a moment to find out. Um, I guess, Anna. Sorry, I closed out of my <laughs> agenda. So I have, a, I have a redundant question and I apologize. We are going to be talking about all of the other uh, 
items in our packet regarding parking. Like we are just closing discussion around the permits process right now, correct? Yes. Great, thank you. We're closing discussion on, on the presentation that was made to us. Yeah, thank you. All right, and I got my agenda back, so we're good. I just didn't wanna miss my chance if there were other, yeah. other process. Thank you. Okay, so I don't see any hands up from attendees. Um, so my question, practical question is, um, kind of like, what do we do now? Um, I know that uh, Councillor Shane had a, has a whole list of questions, but she is not in the uh, audience tonight for public comment. Um, we're gonna have a hearing. Um, uh, we've had discussion, we've had no I, people saying, I agree, or let's change that, or that's too low, or I don't think. Um, okay, because if we have specific things that we want to need to, to talk about more or vote on, this is the time. Yes, um, Shalini. Yeah, two things that come to mind. One is that uh, we would need uh, to hear at some point, right, from the Transportation Advisory Committee, maybe. And I know that uh, Tracy said that she might be able to come later today and so she might speak to us, but, but I think we need to invite a formal written recommendation uh, from them. Am I right, Paul? Right. Yeah, so, so you will be having a public hearing, so you can ask the, t the TAC if you'd like their advice on this. Um, that's up to you who, who you'd like to advise, ask for advice from. I mean, you could ask advice from the business improvement district as well mm -hmm. and, and, and residents or right. property owners, whoever you want to ask advice from. The finance committee is also planning to um, uh, talk yeah. about this at an yeah, upcoming complaint. meeting. Oh, so shouldn't we be quick because we don't want to barrage the same people with the same questions. So maybe there needs to be more coordination between the finance committee and us. Uh, and have like a shared pool of questions because I know people are really busy we, when we try to reach out to the businesses or different stakeholders. So maybe how do we coordinate that? So what's been helpful to us in the past on things like this is if everyone sends the question, their questions to sort of a central person, they can uh -huh. kind of group duplicate. So we have Kathy's questions, for example, um, mm -hmm. and we've, we do have answers to them if, if anybody, we can send those out after. Um, and yeah, so if people, if we can agree on sort of a central person to receive those questions, we can group them and then get the, the responses out to everybody. Um, okay, Andy, did you have something you wanted to say here? Yeah, actually it follows up very perfectly on what Shalini mm -hmm. was just talking about and what was just being discussed. So timing is great. Um, the finance committee has planned to talk about this on uh, the 15th of February and uh, we we're well aware that um, the next report, we were supposed to report back from both committees just to let the council know where we're at uh, by March 7 meeting of the council. Um, so uh, we'll probably go ahead and do that after that point. Um, but uh, uh, the, the focus is going to be much more on the uh, transportation fund and the financial implications for the transportation fund and those kinds of things because it's mm -hmm. not about parking policy strictly. Uh, Kathy of course is vice chair of finance and she may have been just assuming that she was going to hold her questions for really pressing to get answers. I don't know the whether that's what she planned but it's possibility. Uh, mm -hmm. What we have done in the past when there has been um, a financial implications to things before TSO is that the uh, finance committee tries to complete its report and send it to TSO before the public hearing. So mm -hmm. uh, we would have need to know what the public hearing is because uh, you know, it's just sort of as a natural flow that the that it be information that's available for the public hearing, and that the um, actual final recommendation mm -hmm. uh, is dealing with policy and that's broader than finance um, comes out of the TSO meeting after the forum. So, from having been previously on TSO, I wanted to share that piece with you too. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't know if we have to decide anything. So you'll have to tell me, but we do have to say, I guess when we're gonna have the hearing date and um, this, I, I, I find this kind of challenging because, um, okay, you say you're going to meet on the 15th of um, February. Do you think you'll accomplish your task in one meeting, Andy? I don't know. And it depends in part upon um, how pressed this group is to just move forward and get to a conclusion and uh, make a recommendation to the council, which then, of course, requires the uh, public hearing. As far as the public hearing, I think that it would be a good idea uh, for us as TSO to come up with a date for a public hearing fairly soon because uh, Athena has uh, to work on the notice end of it and there are notice requirements for uh, any kind of uh, public hearing and uh, we have to make sure that she has the uh, requisite time uh, between when we decide to have the mm -hmm. hearing and it's actually Oh. Dorothy, may I make a suggestion? Yes. yes. I was just looking at the, the, the meeting schedule that TSO adopted. And thank you, Andy, for pointing out that we need time to publish notice of the public hearing. I was looking at the meeting schedule that TSO adopted. It looks like we're too late to notice the hearing on February 17, but March 10, we would have time to notice a public hearing in the newspaper. It needs to be published for two weeks, which is why we need a little bit more lead time. And that would give finance committee um, a little bit more time to complete their review as well. Right, because um, we would have to meet and discuss that on, uh, we, or we may need to do final discussion on March 24th and you want the results from TSO by April. Is that correct? Or, or do you think that we could have the hearing and then give you the information you need on March 10th? And that would be time. The, the way other committees and I think TSO has done in the past is schedule a deliberation and vote on the same night as the hearing. And then if they're ready to vote, then they can vote. And if they're not, then it would be deferred to the next meeting. Okay. But if you're asking um, if the town can wait for a recommendation until after March, then I think Paul and Sean would need to answer that. Right. Uh, Paul. Actually. Jen is the one who manages it. So when do you need to know in terms of ordering permits, Jen? Um, there's been about an eight week lead time for um, between ordering and receiving shipment. So if we're gonna go, if we're gonna change it to July 1st, we would need to know by the end of April to be able to get everything in time. Okay. So it, it, it looks like we can do that. Um, Anna. Sure, so um, if we need to finish up that this conversation, I'm going in a little bit of a different direction. So I'm happy okay. to pause if there's more on this. So let us say then we'll have a- And I think Paul might, I'm oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Paul raised his hand right as I said. Okay, if there's okay, I see it now. Thank, yeah, thank you, Paul. So I just wanna be clear what you're actually voting on. And what mm -hmm. you're actually voting on are the regulations that were in your packet. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a red line version in there that, and I think that that's actually, and that includes all the, what, what we presented is sort of a summary of the changes, but the actual changes that you will vote on are the regulations that were in the packet. And so that's how um, we would advertise this because it's the regulations that you're changing. And that's the recommendation you'll be making to the um, town council. Well, I, I see that we could vote on one and three but I don't, don't think we're ready to vote on number two, which has to do with the money until after we hear from the finance committee. But, uh, you know, maybe I, I'm getting it wrong, but- No, I think by March 10th, when you, so let's think, so you have, we've made the presentation, the finance committee will do its deliberation. You will have your public hearing on March 10th. And tonight you may say, hey, TAC, we would like to hear your opinion as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, then you have your public hearing on March 10th. You take into consideration for what TAC has to say, what the finance committee has to say. Right. You then can act that night or the next time you meet. Mm -hmm. That's a, depending on how much information you have and the, what the public weighs in on. And then you'll be able to make your final decision. But the actual motion will be about amending the parking regulations. 
Great, great. Yeah, which are the one, two, and three recommendations, right? It's it's actually a very detailed document that's in, that was in your packet. That's a red line version that shows it. it oh, the red line version. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So you, yeah. Asina is showing it. But I know that there's going to be more discussion on some of the uh, the, th the fee amounts. And so um, we don't have all the, I don't think we're ready to vote on all of this tonight is what I'm saying. Um, okay, so um, Anna, uh, well, okay, we gotta finish this up. So can we leave it that we will set the hearing date for March 10th and that when we hear from finance and we hear from the public uh, and TAC at the hearing that we will then deliberate and make a uh, motion and a vote and um, is that sufficient? That would that would be voting that we would do that. Okay. So hands up. To, okay. All right. So uh, I'd like to entertain a motion. Um, There's hands up, Dorothy. Okay. She told me it was a different matter, so that's why I. Did well, talk. I mean, we. Can, I don't want to close anything before I get to ask the question. Okay. Great. Go ahead, Anna. I'm sorry. Okay. Thought, so uh, you. it's okay, and I know Shalini and Anika also. Or, Anika's on down, but um, I, so I have a couple of things in the red line document. I'm happy to save them until the um, the hearing or, but just give you, and I'm sure I will have more when I give it a third pass through, but um, the first is looking at, so looking at 4.4, well, let's just go through four. So um, my question is about the, the definition of a household. So 4.6 talks about a household is defined as an individual dwelling unit or group residence, regardless of the number of persons residing therein. And then it says that under visitor passes, um, you can have no more than a maximum of, of 60 days worth per household. So we've got buildings downtown that hold far more than 60 people. And so I, I just am concerned about the, the um, how that's going to how that's going to be tracked, how that's going to be measured when you have the potential. And I know that some of those buildings have their own parking areas as well, but um, it's just ringing as, as a potential issue when we've got households with that might be needing more than, hypothetically might be needing more than 60 permits. And I, I know that's kind of a can of worms, so I apologize for that, throwing that at you, but um, yeah. I, that's the, oh yeah yeah I, i'm 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 not sure what i'm what you're did i do it wrong I, i'm not yeah i mean a household is a it can be an apartment it can be a house well so um, that's my question is it the build because it says it says group residence and so i think clarifying that that means the apartment within the building not the building itself yeah i think i mean jen can correct this by it is the a, a, an apartment is considered an individual household Okay, so the reason I'm saying that is because that's the whole snafu with those tests that got sent out was because they counted apartment buildings as one household. So I do think it's it's sorry, let me let me give context. When the federal government was sending out testing, there was a huge issue where people were registering by address. Oh yeah. And so it was so I just want to make sure that doesn't happen here, right? So if we're counting apartments, that needs to be really clear. Mm -hmm. Um in that. And then my other thing was, I just, I, I want to put that bug back in your ear about those Boltwood lot spots, those permanent, those long-term spots. I mean, those are our only covered parking and to only raise it by 250 or 150 feels, feels a little low to me. And I recognize that that's in line with Northampton's garage. However, um, we have, I, I mean, I don't know. I think I'd, I'd love to see a, maybe a revisiting of that, or at least really understanding the justification for not raising that um, more. And if it's a good justification, I will believe you, but um, I'd, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Okay, uh, is there anyone else or do we have any comment from uh, Shalini? Uh, yeah, I think I also want, definitely, I'm not sure about the rates again, given that what we're seeing at UMass uh, one East Pleasant Street, Northampton. Um, it's it just feels really low. 
both of them, like even, I mean, not the employees. I feel like employees we should not touch because yeah, uh, for obvious reasons, but the other parking permits, I mean, it just seems really super low. So what, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't even know how to go about having this discussion, but it's just what the point, the, just the reference points that we have are so low that, I mean, are so high and we're so low relative to that. So, I mean, did, did we, did you all speak with other people or like, how did we come up with this? I understand that we're trying to be very gentle with the increases, but it seems too gentle somehow. Okay, and that's saying, saying a lot from Shalini, who generally likes things to be gentle. So Sean, <laughs> do you have an answer? Or uh, Jennifer, who wants to answer this one? You both have your hand up. Okay. So, we, so we are proposing a 1,600% a increase to the, <laughs> to the resident permit. So I get, again, there, I think there's two things. Um, we can look at the rates again. I think the goal here wasn't just to increase the rates for the sake of increasing rates. It was to, we had a goal behind increasing the rates and that was to generate funding for capital. Um, so we can look at the rates again. And, and again, the, the, these aren't magic numbers where like this number is perfect. So, um, it, you know, we're open to the feedback and it's really helpful and we can, we can look at it and, and come back with some, maybe some revisions. But I will say, again, one of the goals aside from raising money for capital is to keep these spots attractive. Um, so that people park in them, because if people stop parking in them and start using the downtown lots more um, and the meters, then it, they lose sort of their effect of getting people to park on the periphery of downtown. Um, and these spots aren't, you know, these aren't people who are parking right outside where they live. And then it's, you know, it's their spot. They're walking, generally walking a distance to where they live. So they're not, um, you just have to keep in mind that there's a convenience factor there too, that might be different with like, uh, with like the one East Pleasant Street spots, for example. Um, but no, we can look at those. Um, if, if the feedback from the committee is that they're too low, we can certainly, we could consider larger fees um, or higher fees. We might want to do the hearing first to see, um, you know, what we hear from the community with these fees already um, before we adjust them again. Okay, and I see Anika. So yes, understanding that the fees raise over a three year period, has there been thought as to after that, because I'm assuming seeing as they, you know, the, the increases are uh, quite modest. So after the three years, Amherst could be, you know, further away from say, you know, the pricing and other lots. Is there, would, um, would we be stuck rather after three years with the same increase? Um, or could that be adjusted after that three years, seeing how it goes? Yeah, at, yeah no, it, it could be adjusted. Um... It could be adjusted again at that time. And I think we want to look at it every single year. And one of the reasons we want to do it over three years is to just make sure, again, there's no impact to demand. If, if we start seeing demand drop for some of these spots, then that might be a red flag that the price increase is going up too quickly. Um, you know, it doesn't do anybody good, anybody really any good if the, if the number of permits goes down. Um, so, but we can, after FY25, or as of right now, the, the permit level would stay there, but we re would review it on an annual basis. Um, and if we think that there's still steps to go, we could still increase it after that. And uh, Andy. Yeah, um, I guess there's a couple of things that I thought about in, uh, in the order that they came into my head. One is that when Anna was talking about uh, the re proposed regulations for, in 4.6 and the def definition of a household, uh, we may want to consider, uh, as we're revising this, a more specific definition of a household, mm -hmm. because it strikes me that there are three different scenarios. One is an entire building, usually in the form of a house that may have been subdivided, that may have more than one unit um, or an apartment building. But there's also a unique situation that exists uh, as far as we're aware that um, some landlords are renting specifically to multiple tenants in one um, apartment unit um, so that it's, the rental is going either by the room or by the bed. 
And uh, it's, um, that is true, but I think that um, a, a better definition of the term household may be in order and we may need help from town council to think about that because they may have experience in other communities with um, how household gets defined for the purposes that we're seeking. So that um, was one thing which then sort of trips into the second one is that I think that we do have to recognize from having all been um, through a campaign recently where we were talking with lots of our uh, residents who were considering whether to vote for us about what their concerns are. And one of the things that I have consistently heard over the past um, numerous elections since I've uh, run townwide four times is a question of uh, what is happening with why, why uh, the town is uh, helping to solve a problem for landlords who are choosing not to include sufficient parking within their units by having a very low cost um, permit system. And um, so there actually are probably two reasons that we should be visiting this. One is the one that has been cited several times already, which is the importance of generating sufficient funds in our uh, transportation enterprise fund, which also, by the way, um, uh, helps to pay for our PDTA expenses. Uh, but the other is um, the question of um, addressing that parking issue that we've heard about from residents who feel that um, the town is uh, enabling uh, construction that doesn't include parking that ought to be included within the uh, plan developed. So those are my two points. Um, I would like to add something else in this evaluation process. Um, I know that at one topic that's been raised is looking to see that in a space, you might actually be able to fit four cars instead of three in terms of where the lines are drawn. But um, there's a particular, and I'm, I'm, I don't think it's gonna be the only one, but certainly on uh, Amity Street um, where there is parking and there's permit parking, it's too close to the driveway of the existing buildings and it's very dangerous to exit. So in this overlooking, I, just to make sure that the lines, there's sufficient sight line from the driveways, because um, that Amity one is very, very dangerous. Um, it's, I, I think in front of like, was it 175? Um, and there are a couple of other places where you cannot see. And when you come out of the uh, Marsh condos, you can't see because the permit cars are too close to the house. So it's a question of just checking the lines and you might lose a little bit of space there, but you might be able to gain it back by making some of the spaces a little tighter. I think Guilford has mentioned, he thought there could be a tightening up of some of those spaces um, um, because this is, we're not gonna do this kind of overhaul that often, I don't think. Um, or is there a problem with that? So I should ask, is there a problem with doing that, Paul? So yeah, that, that's not what we're, that's not on, we, we can look at that for sure, mm -hmm. but you know, that's not something that this, that this committee would be looking at at this moment. You're looking at the parking permit system, not the lines on the road. Right, right. It's true, but it is related because it's the problem is created by permit parking. So, um, uh -huh. okay, uh, Anna. Anna, Anna. Um, does this apply to motorcycles? These permits, can you permit a motorcycle? And is it the same cost, same location? And um, if it's your secondary vehicle? Um, it, it does apply. Um, I don't know where they would stick the permit, but but yes, it does apply to motorcycles. Thank you. That was just, that that your your uh, quip was my kind of comment was I don't know how many I don't know if it's relevant, but maybe worth adding a paragraph of where to put the sticker if you have a motorcycle. You're, you're, you're talking to a motorcyclist there, with Jennifer. <laughs> I, you know, I it I feel like that was a valid question then. Then I wasn't silly for saying I don't know where they would put the sticker. Well, so thank you. if if they have a windshield, they could put it on there. But other than that, I'm. I don't have any other options. Yeah, so I don't know if it, in the track changes document if it's worth including that or not. Um, but I just I noticed that it wasn't in there. Thank you. 
So I, I did see there was a price for motorcycles that may have been in the Boltwood garage, but I, in, in reviewing all the material for, for the meeting tonight, I did see a price for motorcycles, maybe like $96 or something like that. Um, oh, I missed that. Sorry. Yeah. So if, if, if where, where was it? Where's uh, Jennifer can tell us, I'm sure. I don't oh. believe there's a different price for motorcycles. Oh, Dorothy, okay. that, that might have been on the UMass. I don't know if you were looking at the UMass pricing, but they have a separate call out for motorcycles. Um, I don't it might have been. It, it might have been. Okay. I, I thought it was on one of ours, but we can check that out later. Um, okay. So again, um, we have said that we would try to, we would have a hearing. We have not, we have not had a vote on it. We need to have a vote on it. Okay. Um, Shalini, you've got your hand up. Oh, this is just continuing with, um, when do we finish this discussion about the rates, uh, especially after hearing what Andy's um, comment was that we've all heard from residents. So in terms of, again, the order of things, we are going to assign somebody as a central person to send all the questions to for the different stakeholders. And then uh, those stakeholders will be informed about the public forum, right? And then March 10th, we have the public forum. And then by then we have the information from TAC, Finance Committee, the public, which hopefully includes all the residents and all the other stakeholders. And then we'll make the, uh, we'll have a discussion and vote. So at this point, we're not discussing any more about um, the points that were raised. Yes, Paul. That's precisely correct, Chalini, is that you will, tonight you'll say, here's our schedule. Here's where, who we're asking for advice from, i.e. TAC. And you already, the council has already said you, we, you want, they want you to hear from the Finance Committee. Mm -hmm. And then you have your, we will uh, notice the public hearing, which makes it available to the public. On March 10th, you'll conduct your public hearing. You will consider all the info. You can tell TAC and the Finance Committee you'd like their comments before March 10th. And then you can either make that weigh all those things, considerations. Um, you can vote, you can change any of the things that are in front of you. If you think the fees are too low, you can move to amend those fees and make it whatever, at wherever level you want, that's up to you. And then you vote on it and it'll be a recommendation to the full town council, which will then make the final vote. And right. then, and just a, cl a clarification, oh, can I ask that question now, Dorothy? Yeah, no, the question you first started with is uh, my question too. Who yeah. do we send Yeah, to? exactly. Oh, so I would suggest that you send them to Sean. And so he can be the, if that's You're okay, it. Sean, You're he's it. the quarterback for this. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I have some already, so I can, it'll okay. be good. I can add them to the list. Okay. Um, yeah. And can you yeah. also, I, can we just confirm who the different stakeholders are at this point? And then Sean, will you, who will, I mean, I know we're going to broadcast and publish the announcement, but will we also be inviting like through email and who's going to be doing that, the specific stakeholders? So who are the stakeholders, um, like the businesses we identified or who, who else, like the bid or chamber or? So I would hmm. guess, uh, I mean, the permit holders are the biggest constituent group. They're, mm -hmm. they're the ones most impacted by it. Um, we can talk to the bid and ask them to notify their members because it is in their jurisdiction area. area. Right. Um, you said you wanted to hear from TAC and mm -hmm. of course the finance committee. Are there other groups that, I'm not sure, I think we could probably notify the permit holders. I'm not sure if we have information to send them, Jennifer. Jen, do we have an email list that we could send to everybody who owns a permit? We do, yes. Mm. Okay. And then there'll be, be the publication lively. in the in the on the on the town bulletin board and in the newspaper. So I mm -hmm. think the word will be out there. It's not at that big a group actually who are going to be impacted. Um, and Anika, I should have lowered my hand, but I was going to ask if there was a an email list for the permit holders, and maybe as well is there one that would be able to include all of the. Um, Town, let, oh, I know that bid could reach out, but any other um, town building that, you know, could, that should be at the meeting or know about it, that we could just email everyone at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
happen. And Anna. Uh, so here was my train of thought. As Shalini was saying, what group should we talk to? I was thinking, should we talk to the Disability Access Advisory Committee as well, um, which that's thing one for, for TSO is, um, is that another group we should consider? And then for Sean and Jennifer, what, oh, it's, I'm looking, I'm literally looking at the paragraph right now. So never mind. I answered my own question by finding it in the document. So never mind. Cause I was going to ask what the plan was for folks who needed a handicap parking st uh, spot as well. Thank you. So my question stands for TSO though. Do we want to bring in uh, the disability advice? I'm, I'm messing up the acronym, aren't I? Or do we think that it's covered in the document as it stands? Okay, Paul has his hand up. So, so uh, this is a parking permit system. And so for what you're looking at, it, it doesn't really apply to people holding a handicap placard. They can park anywhere. They can park at a metered spot or non-metered spot. Um, so they, and they don't have to pay. So I don't think this really applies to the DAAC. If you started talking about actual spaces and, and configuration of spaces, that's a different thing. But this, you're just talking about the parking permit system. And my understanding is that you know, if you have a disability placard, you can park anywhere. Including overnight and all of the... Well, unless it's a snow emergency, like mm -hmm. like it is. Right. Yeah. So, so called, handicap can park in a parking, in a place that is marked for a parking permit. Yes. Okay. They can I park did... at a meter. They can park anywhere. Okay. Um, they're not restricted to parking where it says handicap parking. Those are reserved for handicap, mm -hmm. but they can park in any location. I did see something that was news to me, I'm not sure where it was, that said that there were some senior citizen placards. Um, and I would like to hear a little bit more about that. The, the senior citizen placards are issued through the Bangs Community Center through the Council on Aging. And those permits, I believe, are good in the upper level of the garage. Um, Monday through Friday between, I, I want to say like eight and five or nine and five, something like that. And they're intended for um, people to, it, it's to encourage them to come into town and, you know, take mm -hmm. classes at mm -hmm. the bank center or whatever they are using it for. Okay. So it's very limited place, but it's, it's very tied to the banks. Okay. Yes. That's good. Thank you. Okay. So I think that we can then um, I don't know. We have to make a vote. We've, we've made the um, plans. Do, is there a reason that we have to do a vote on this? No, you can agree by consensus. Okay. So I think we've kind of talked this through. We've got a sense of our time frame, and that we know that we're going to be hearing some other information. Um, and we've said that Sean is the point person and uh, we've identified the people who will be sending questions and we will look forward to an interesting forum and further deliberation. Um, so actually we're going to get, get through with this sooner than I thought we would, um, because the clock is ticking for the, getting the placards, the, the signs, whatever. Okay. Um, the next item, let me think, um, let's see, all right, is our, oh, I wanted to do town manager appointments, um, just because I don't, I think we could do them quickly before we get onto the work plan. I think the work plan might be a longer discussion and it's 8.33. Um, are you ready to go with your appointments, Paul? Yeah, so there's only one appointment and that's for the Board of License Commissioners and that's Doug Slaughter for a reappointment. He was on the original, he was, as you all know, a former select board member, um, former finance committee member. Uh, he has um, been on the, um, he was uh, one of the original appointees to the, um, uh, Board of License Commissioners when the council when it when the charter first took effect, um, and I will I've changed his term so it, instead of expiring in January it will expire in June so it's like basically a two and a half year appointment, um, and this will be his second appointment year. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, um, anyone want to make a motion that we? Um, accept the town manager's recommendation for the appointee for the board of license. I'd make that motion. Okay, good. And a second to that? Second. Great. Okay. I will call the question. Um, Shalini. 
Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Andy. Yes. Yes. Um, Anika. Yes. Anna. Yes. Dorothy. <laughs> yes, so it is unanimous, um, five to zero. Okay. Um, I have a list of items that we need to uh, talk about in terms of our work plan. Um, but one of them we could, it's my number, and the, the one I have listed second was the lunch carts, because I believe that all we have to do is to re formally refer that to the Board of license, lic Licensees or Licensers. licensors. Um, is that correct, Paul? Hmm. So I heard that at a previous meeting that we would, all we were to do was to refer it. I think, I think you mean delegate. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Delegate. Fine. Um, I'd ask you to actually um, clarify the difference between refer and delegate. That would be useful for me. Are you asking me or, or what, Paul, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> Okay, so refer means you're going to give it to someone to make a to, to, to reference it to them so that they can make an opinion. I, I think what they can make a judgment. I see Andy has his hands up, but I think delegate means that instead of this, this being within the powers of the council, you would recommend that the council say we want to give it to the board of license commissioners. And I think that was the intent that the, oh. you want to take these lunch carts away from the council and give it to the board of license commissioners. So then I then what well, the motion we would want is that we then suggest that the council delegate it. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. that, yes, that's right. Is that right, Andy? Yeah, Dorothy, I think it's a little more complicated than you're just making it out to be. I sent you a email after our last meeting explaining what had happened here. And um, so I probably need to just revisit it quickly for the uh, committee as a whole. With the lunch okay. cart, there were actually two different issues because one was um, the, the lunch cart um, itself, which would be a decision ultimately of the license commissioners. But the second was that if the goal was to park um, the lunch cart in the public way, then it is a separate public way issue, which has to be approved by the council through the public way policy and um, which um, reaches the council after um, review and recommendation from TSO. And it was that second part that uh, really um, the last um, TSO ran I'm on and what happened in the final discussion of it was that um, we felt that it was uh, important to change, to do a modification of the uh, actual um, policy itself in order to um, have a uh, easy way of just granting um, if there, uh, the the right to use a parking place. And of course there was a second issue which was payment for the use of those parking places if they were metered spots and uh, which is uh, particularly true around the common. And uh, I put it, I think at the, after the last discussion at a TSO meeting, which was in the prior TSO and um, I said to, um, Chairman Ross, that I would draft changes to the policy that would achieve the result that the committee was describing. And I did so um, and sent it along to Evan, but uh, we never had opportunity to get to back to it because we were under a lot of pressure to uh, get the Kendrick Park um, area done before and the end of the time when the uh, committee's workspace ran out. So I, and that was what I sent you was my email to um, Evan with mm -hmm. my suggestion of how the um, uh, policy could be changed to accommodate that. Well, 
I do have that in front of me, and I would have to say that um, I think that we're going to have to discuss it because I, I've read it and it's not immediately clear to me that these you have short term requests and long term requests, and in red, um, it's about what do you do when you somebody wants it longer term, and I, I wouldn't have any idea. So we obviously need to discuss that in some kind of detail. Um, so is we're trying to make a work plan in a timeline. So the question is, um, in what what order we take things, and how long we think they're going to take. So um, is this an item that is, well, I get, I mean, the, the, they're using they're on the streets right now. So is this uh, really an item that you think is really time sensitive, Andy? And that we need to act on quickly. I don't know that we have any on the streets right now at all. Uh, the one that we have is on a sidewalk. The one that's a town yeah. uh, that I went to the um, market, the farmers market. I bought something from Thai. What's it? I didn't realize it was parked on the sidewalk. You're saying it wasn't on the street. Um, that may have been um, done through the Farmers Market Committee as a part of its license use of the public way, which is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is somebody bringing in a food truck right. or food cart and parking it on either a sidewalk or on the street itself and in a parking place and how we make how those decisions get made and uh, we were thinking of uh, delegating the um, right to have the cart license commission but we were not giving away our public way authority and that's what this discussion is about is um, actually using parking places um, to do that. And, uh, you know, this has been a uh, issue that I've probably spent more time in my life on than I ever wanted to because the select board talked about it forever. Okay, so, okay, Anna, I'm gonna call on you, but I'm gonna say right now, what I think we're supposed to do is kind of decide some order that we take things in. Um, and, and some estimate of how, what time we might need. So, Anna. Yeah, so um, Dorothy, one quick thing. I think the microphone on your computer is underneath your papers. And so when you move them around, it's a little hard to hear you, just so you know. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. You're welcome. Uh, so I haven't, I don't think I've seen Andy's notes on this. Um, Andy, are you saying that you've drafted policy revisions that we could look at and consider? Or are you just, or have you drafted kind of general outline thoughts on so I, I admit I got a little jumpy when it was we just need to refer it because this seems like a really big thing to discuss um, and and get input on from you know I think Paul mentioned local businesses have a lot of thoughts on this um, you know I, I think this is uh, when we consider time I know that a lot of work has been done but I also think that this is not um, a, a quick simple thing mm -hmm. um, and then I believe Andy what you were talking the one food truck, to be specific, the one food truck that I can think of is out uh, outside of the church downtown, right? Yeah, okay. Um, outside of where Bart's used to be. So yeah, so I, I think this is something that I'd like to see given good time into. Uh, I don't know if it needs to be like the, the, I don't know if I've been here long enough to estimate how long things are gonna take. I think that's where I'm struggling a little bit. Okay. Um, I have a couple. Well, I can send you what I said before, but it really dealt with uh, how decisions can be ma um, made regarding the use of actual parking places to park a food truck. At earlier times, there were food trucks that were interested in regularly locating in Amherst, and there were various tensions that came about because on the one hand, food trucks had become very popular around the country um, as a, a way for 
of you know small business people to be able to do something special and to offer some kind of unique food offering to the public and uh there was a real desire um to at least consider that possibility um but as noted um that was not exactly popular with um all of the restaurant owners in town and um you know the uh which is where the bids interest came in so but but i think that that's um almost uh, you know a, a different issue from the public way uh, piece that i was talking about and you know with the chair's permission i can um do a little bit of a memo and send out that uh, and attach that email that i sent to uh evan uh, after our last discussion in which which was really dealing with that public way use of parking mm -hmm. place that would be very good um andy if you do that um and give some more detail um i have a comment but i see paul's hand up yeah just a quick um so andy did and other members of the select board did spend a substantial part of their youth um, dealing with uh, this thing that it, which never really materialized. There was never demand for this anyway. But I think the question before your committee is, do you want to consider giving this to board of license commissioner? You don't have to make the decisions about the substance or do you want to spend your time in the substance of it and keep it by the council? And that's really the decision. And I think mm -hmm. I think Andy's idea of writing a memo to the committee and saying, here's what I recommend would be a smart way to go. Um, I want to mention that I think that we should check out some surrounding towns, such as East Hampton. Um, from what I've heard, the future of food is in food carts. Food carts are where the adventurous new food is happening. And uh, I do understand there's a conflict with people with brick and mortar, which means that there'd have to be um, an appreciable fee um, for the food cart, because the people who are in buildings are spending a lot of money in order to do it. But um, not to have food carts does not go with the uh, destination Amherst that I've been hearing about. Um, so I think see it as a really complicated issue. Um, Dorothy, I'm, I'm gonna inter interject right here and please, I apologize. Um, but this specific item isn't listed on the agenda as a discussion item. And so I feel like we're wading into kind of the substance okay. of an issue that okay. was only listed as part of the transition memo to talk about the work plan and timeline. So okay. I, I just wanna caution you about um, making sure that, that that agenda item is posted before we start talking in, in depth about it. Great, I thank you very much, Athena. Um, so, in terms of work plan, um, some of the things I think that this is, I, I did this from notes that you already had. Um, uh, Anika had her hand up, Dorothy, to oh, say no. Okay, Anika. Uh, it, it's okay. I think I was going, I'm going into the territory that Athena just told us to avoid, but I was just wondering, like, if we are to delegate on to, like, uh, the license commission, then wouldn't they then be able to partner, you mentioned Destination Amherst, then with the the bid to maybe look at the uniqueness of the trucks and you know allow them to maybe come up come up with their own plan that could you know better serve or be more comfortable for existing businesses that's certainly an interesting idea um i think right now that we have to just try to say in terms of work plan you know items i can list the items to you and send them out to you and you can uh prioritize them for me, but we have the parking permits, we have the lunch carts. Um, there are some that I added from other things were said. We have speed limits and safety zones. These are things that have already been referred to us that we have spoken about. Um, composting, trash removal and recycling. Uh, someone said, and I don't know the details of this, aligning public way policies. So I gather there are more than one public way policies. Uh, priorities in road and sidewalk repair, um, public interface regarding pothole repair. Um, at a previous discu a discussion at a different meeting, um, it was suggested that we add the whole topic of the municipal parking district. Um, and we have the North Pleasant Street upgrades. I think we're done. We voted on that, but I'm not positive. And then in the future, we have the North Amherst 
traffic changes. We have outreach, out, outreach plans, uh, senior services, service the vulnerable and underserved, climate action, and reviewing fees for services. So I went through the notes and the things that people had asked. And those are things that people brought up. And um, I had a question on one of these transportation reports in small print on the last page was something about making a capital request for engineering study for Boltwood Garage. And my question is, do we have to play any role in that? Or is that something that the town hall takes care of? So those are the items that I have in terms of work plan. So Paul and then Andy. Yeah, so on the the last item about the Boltwood Garage, that is something that would be a finance committee that the town is looking at for the, a capital project. So you don't, that you can take that off your list. Great, so that's finance committee, great. And Andy. Yeah, um, this gets back to the North Pleasant um, Street. There were really two pieces of North Pleasant Street that were being dealt with in separate projects. The one that got done for the most part, not with its entirety, but almost done is the uh, uh, one near Kendrick Park along Henry Park, which both had to do with changing it to one way and uh, whether in the parking, and that's been done and moved along. The uh, little piece that was in there is there's um, one block section that's not one way, and uh, whether that should be revisited at some point it was sort of left open at the end of that last discussion within the committee. Um, that's a small uh, thing. The, the bigger project, however, is um, from Eastman Lane, where the traffic circle is at the university near the uh, uh, Graduate Research Center in Totman, all the way up to Pine Street sidewalks. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a fairly substantial uh, memorandum and drawings uh, that came out of PW from Paul and uh, Guilford to the council uh, probably around July, so I believe. Um, and it was mm -hmm. so and um, it, was, it was at the same time that Kendrick Park came up and the uh, uh, urging of Guilford was is pay attention and give me some answers around uh, Kendrick Park, um, that it's more vital that that be the priority of the two. So the second piece was left behind. The other thing I wanted to, this is very um, much on score with that, is that there was a district one meeting on um, the uh, Sunday afternoon, which mm -hmm. I attended because I, to try as counselor at large to attend as, as often as I can. And uh, since that sidewalk would be within district one, there was a discussion of why it was getting priority over another one, which is East Pleasant Street. There was uh, you know, some comments about it, but um, it was discussed to some extent within a district meeting and so I'll leave it at that. Okay, um, um, Paul, you had your hand up. You have your hand up. So, so I know we only have seven minutes left. Um, so, and I know you have to do minutes in addition, but maybe a path forward for, for you in terms of prioritizing, like let's prioritize the next couple meetings. And I, what I hear is that if Andy does his memo on the um, delegation of the food carts, and then we are prepared to do a sort of a, 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 a presentation to you on how we look at roads and what gets prioritized. And that will take us probably a good hour of your time. Um, and, you know, and sidewalks could be part of that or a, as a separate meeting as well. So I think those were priorities and it sort of comes at a good time in terms of where we are in terms of budget and uh, things. So our staff are, is prepared to give you, it's really, it's really an interesting presentation actually. Um, so maybe those, the, what the and sort of prioritize those things as sort of next in upcoming agenda items. And then all that long list you had, maybe the council, the committee members can sort of consider what are their other priorities that they want to mm -hmm. take on during the course of the year. Okay, that sounds good. And the committee members can let me know. And I see Anna and I see Shalini with their hands up. 
Sure. So, um, Paul, that was uh, really in line with what I was thinking. Um, Dorothy, you, you listed off um, a, a big long list and I want to make sure I've got them all and I don't think I do. Are you able to send that yes. long list? Um, because I think we want to make sure we're thinking strategically. And I know as I was listening to you, I heard some things that really should be going together um, and, and some things that are minute parts of a bigger thing that we should be, right, right, that's right. where we should be focusing. And so, yeah, if you could send that list and I think maybe if we all could agree to do our own prioritization, but also thinking through kind of looking at it strategically at what makes sense to group and what makes sense to zoom out on a little bit too, that might be really very helpful. Right. Yes. No, this was trying to just gather the things that had been said and brought up by the committee members um, and adding something. Yes, Shalini. Yeah, I was uh, going to say that in terms of prioritizing, um, just looking at projects through the environmental climate action goals lens uh, and inviting maybe at some point ECAC to um, also to our uh, committee and uh, sharing what we work on and seeing where they can help us bring that lens because they they came to our committee crc last time and uh with respect to housing policy and it was really helpful to have because there's ways that we could not even think about it so i think just having them here we don't know what it is going to turn out but it'll be helpful and similarly with tac and mm -hmm. i know that we have very little time and tracy zafian uh, the tac chair is here and we haven't done public comments. So if you wanna do that now, and then we can complete our discussion after. Okay, I, I will, um, Andy's gonna send out the details on the lunch carts. I will send out the, the list. Um, Paul has given us a good way ahead for the near future. And we know we've got the uh, forum coming up. Um, so uh, if it's okay with all of you, I will uh, ask if someone wants to give public comment. Um, and all you have to do is to raise your hand. And I see Tracy's hand. And um, uh, I guess Athena will have to let Tracy into the room. Yep, go ahead, Tracy. Oh, hi. Um, yes, so, well, I do have a few comments. Um, thank you. I know it's the end of your long meeting. Unfortunately, I wasn't here earlier because I had another meeting on my own. But I guess one thing was, I did catch the tail end of your discussion about the parking permit proposal. And if it is going to be referred to TAC and as TAC being stakeholders, I guess I would ask that you provide some guidance about what aspects of the plan you would like tax input on. I know that I personally, as somebody who might think about parking way too much, have ideas about many aspects, but I don't think they're necessarily all under the TAC purview. Um, just on a quick related note, um, for the North Pleasant Street permits um, for North Pleasant Street on the west side of Kendrick Park, I did notice that in the memo that was sent to the town council last week that it does propose continuing to keep um, the permit parking on the west side of that section of North Pleasant Street, and that is was something that the town council voted in December to eliminate the permit parking on the west side of North Pleasant Street mm -hmm. um, as the angled parking was gonna be built on the east side of North Pleasant Street to accommodate parking at the park. Um, so that's just a minor thing. Um, I did have two other comments that are not related to TAC, but mm -hmm. well, they are a little bit, um, but, um, but one has to do, actually both have to do with sidewalks and sidewalk accessibility. Um, so, you know, one thing I care a lot about sidewalks, sidewalk accessibility, um, you know, sidewalks that are difficult to navigate, including in the snow. And so recently I had, you know, been walking, I walk a lot, and I had noticed that there were some sidewalks that weren't shoveled very well. Um, so I wasn't really sure how to ask if somebody could look into it or to follow up with the property owners. Um, on the Amherst website, the town's website, you know, there is this under online services, it says there's the Amherst Connect to submit service requests. And then there's also another category, noise and nuisance property complaints. Um, and the first one, the Amherst Connect service requests, and it says, you know, any kind of quality of life issues, you can submit them here, click here. So I did that, it actually goes to the C Click Fix program. Um, and I just mentioned that I was concerned about this one icy section of sidewalk and curb cuts that weren't clear and so on. And the reply I got back from that system was that the sidewalk clearing is not an 
enforced by the DPW, it's enforced by the police department, please contact the police department issue closed. So I hadn't realized, you know, that only the DPW would be reviewing the C-click fix um, requests. And I didn't know if one thing the town could look at would be to have sort of a one type of system so that people can just submit the requests. After I got that response, I did police website. I could not find anything, snow removal enforcement. Um, and there had there used to be some reporting system that had been removed. So I just, I eventually I just emailed a general police email and said, hey, can somebody look? Um, and I did hear back today from Captain Ting. It was very, he wrote me a very great response. You know, he said, of course, that they are concerned about that. He said that, um, that if people have any, normally those sidewalk complaints about unshoveled sidewalks are dealt with by people just calling the, um, the police desk and calling dispatch. Um, so that was really great that he wrote back to me. I really appreciated it. Um, but it did sort of leave me wondering, like if I hadn't been so persistent, like how would that have been addressed? Would it have been addressed at all? Um, and I guess I also was wondering sort of in the same vein, is anybody ever actually ticketed for not shoving the side? Mm -hmm. I'm just I know that in some of the towns I've worked for and with that sometimes the whole issue of snow shoveling of sidewalks is under inspection services, sort of because it's also viewed as like a property maintenance and upkeep type issue. And for me personally, I'm less concerned about fines for snow removal. I really just want people to understand that it's like important for accessibility and sidewalks. Um, the, and so one just other question and comment I had was that in my neighborhood on notice like since the snowfall the other day that there have been some vehicles that have been parked blocking sidewalk. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Vehicle was actually parked on the sidewalk, um, like parked, you know, along the sidewalk. <laughs> um, and the second, and so that vehicle got moved. Um, but then today I noticed too, that one issue is that in some of the red, Properties that have a large number of vehicles that currently, because of the snow, they are mainly parking on the driveway, parking in any other lots mm -hmm. that they might have had off street. Um, and that due to the snow, when you have those vehicles parking on the driveways, and some of those driveways are pretty short, that their vehicles, the back ends of their vehicles are actually hanging over the sidewalk. I mean, in some cases, like blocking the sidewalk entirely. I'm assuming that that is probably an inspection issue and I can follow up with them, but I just wanted to raise that too, is just as another issue related to sidewalks. So thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, any other, any other public comment? Anyone else want to say something or ask something? All right. Um, do we have any final words here? Um, Did you want to approve minutes quickly? Oh, yes. Um, we have minutes, two sets of minutes. Um, let's see there what the dates are. Um, December 9th and January 18th. Uh, I believe at the last meeting, the question was whether we wanted to delegate somebody to approve them. And I think Anna said the whole committee should do so. Um, I know that I've read them and um, I'm fine with them. Uh, Anna, you've got your hand up. What are your thoughts on this? So many thoughts. No, uh, my only uh, my only thing is maybe for Athena. Maybe I, don't, I know we don't. I don't think we have a minute taker today. Uh, Devlin Gothier is the last name, not just Gothier. So it'd be great if that could be reflected in the minutes going forward. It's a small, non-substantive but meaningful change. Um, okay. Any comments about the minutes, uh, Andy? So. Uh, <clears throat> On the first set of minutes from December, um, you know, it's sort of awkward because I'm the only member of the committee who uh, was on the committee that the meeting was about. Um, and, uh, but I think that it doesn't matter that the entire committee can uh, adopt them. I, I looked at those minutes and I have absolutely 
no changes to offer for them. I think that they were fair and accurate minutes. But the one thing that I found that was um, interesting out of the whole rereading of it was that there was a provision in there um, towards the end about delegating to uh, former uh, Chair Ross the ability to um, approve minutes of meetings that were left over from the last committee on behalf of the committee. And uh, that apparently didn't happen with these minutes, but it's probably too late. Um, though it could, maybe not, uh, we could ask Evan if he wants to approve them or we could just approve them tonight. Um, I am for approving them tonight. Um, because I, I didn't, I don't see anything problematic. And if you haven't found anything, that would be the easiest thing to do. But if anyone has a contrary opinion, now's the time to speak. Um, all right, um, do I have a, a motion to approve the minutes for, um, I guess this is December 9th? I will make that motion. Okay. Second. Great. Um, all right, um, I call from over here. Shalini, how do you vote? Mm. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what Andy said. So I'm gonna abstain. Okay, um, Anna. Yes. Um, Anika. Yes. Andy. Yes. Okay, and Dorothy. Yes, okay. Um, All right, and then the latest set of minutes, which I can't put my hand to, but I did read them, um, mm -hmm. was, um, I guess, January 18th. Um, do we have any questions about those minutes? Athena, is it a problem to change them and do I need to reflect that in a motion? Oh, sorry. I've, I've, already, <laughs> sorry. I've already made that change. So when they're approved, we can, um, if you would just, move to approve as amended. Okay. And I'll make sure that's that okay. makes its way into the final portion. Okay, so I need a motion to approve as amended the meeting minutes of the meeting of January 18th to 2022. Anyone want to make the motion? So moved. Okay. Okay. Any second? second. Okay. Um, I'll start um, Anika. Yes. Okay. And Andy. Yes. Shalini. Yes. And Anna. Yes. And Dorothy. Yes. Okay. Very good. We have approved those. I had down at the very bottom correction of the report uh, that I submitted on January 18th. And one was uh, I had misnamed a group. Um, I had said CART, and it actually should have been C A A R P, the Climate Action and Adaptation, I guess, Resiliency Plan. Okay. Um, so it's not CART, but it is C A A R P. Um, and also, I had uh, misattributed uh, the question about renaming public places for um, Amherst African Americans was put forward by Councillor Ball Milne. So those are two corrections to that report. Um, any questions or problems? Okay, Anna, you got your hand up. Uh, Anika was, oh. I was just going to mention that it was Shalini who had brought up the suggestion about the park. Right, that's that's the correction, that it's Councillor Ball Mill that, that made that correction, that, that, that suggestion, right. Um, okay, Anna. Uh, just really quickly, I. Don't have the report up in front of me. CARP is a plan, it's not a group. It came from ECAC. Okay. CARP is like a, it's a big, big, lovely document that I highly, actually, extremely highly recommend everyone in this committee in particular reads. Um, and I'm happy to send it out to folks if that's helpful, but uh, it's the plan written by ECAC. Okay, very good. Thank you. With Stephanie Chikral. Okay, so I don't think we have anything else, but I'm going to quickly turn the page here. Any items not anticipated um, within 48 hours that anyone wants to bring up? 
Okay. Um, so do I entertain a motion to adjourn? You can no. just declare the meeting adjourned when oh, you're ready. Okay. Okay. All right. I see no hands. I see no. Okay. Very good. Okay. It is now nine ten. Not as bad as I thought it was. Great. Okay. The Thank, meeting is you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Good night.